Welcome to the first video on using Azure Data Factory and transforming data with data flows. I'm going to start from the very beginning here and, and assume that you do not have a lot of hands-on experience within Data Factory already. Now I'm not going to go over all of the different areas of Data Factory. There's a lot of different parts and pieces within Data Factory to allow you to do data integration, ETL, and transformation. I'm going to focus on transformation with data flows, but there are a few basic things that are important to understand and know about Data Factory all up before you really get started. So I'm already on the landing page, the home screen for the Azure Data Factory user interface. This is all browser based. This is my browser. But before I even get here, let me step one uh, step further back, which is the Azure portal. So from the Azure portal, portal.azure.com, I do have a list of data factories that I have already instantiated. So a factory is your top level component within the service and you create a new one by clicking on add. Then you fill out the questions within the form to create a new data factory. All your data factories then will be listed here in the portal and to launch into that UI that I have open there, you'll click on one of your factories. And then on the right hand side in the, uh, in the portal, there will be an author and monitor button. You click on that and that will open up the browser to where we're going to start, which is from the home page. The home page is really just a landing page of different links and some videos. These are weekly videos that uh, are recorded by the program management team. And then there are tutorials down here, and there's a couple extra links at the bottom. The tutorials are uh, some of the sort of hands on. Um, documents and articles that walk you through how to use different parts of Data Factory. This is where you're going to want to go to learn more about other parts of Data Factory. I'm going to focus here on transforming data, mapping data flows. We'll talk a little bit about wrangling data flows too, so I'm just going to generically call it data flows from this point on. So the, the buttons to get you started are over here. There is a create pipeline, create data flow, create both them from template, copy data and configure SSIS. We're not going to focus on copy or SSIS. We'll talk a little bit about templates, Templates are for the pipelines and data flows let you go directly to create data flows. And then on the left hand side, you'll also see buttons for the, uh, this is the overview page that we're on right now at the top. This is the um, editing or authoring button to create your pipelines and flows. And at the bottom is to monitor, to look at the, uh, to be able to monitor and look at the executions that have run in the past or that are currently running. So let's start by uh, creating on um, the pipelines. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to so we click on the pencil, what we'll do is we'll go right into an empty canvas. And so this is where you could, although it kind of gives the impression that you're really here on the pipeline canvas, you're really at an empty data factory canvas. So all of your resources are on the left hand side and you could create any of these new as a new uh, resource right here on this canvas. The other two buttons for the, on the home page, I'll go back to it here, to create a, a new pipeline, a pipeline from a template, or to create a data flow, those will take you directly to the experience to create new um, entities for those types. And you can also get to that from up here under factory resources when you click the plus sign. These are all the same uh, sorts of options right here. Now let me just start by creating a new pipeline. So every uh, data transformation data flow that you make has to execute within a pipeline. You can create data flows and you can explore your data and you can debug it and you can test with it outside of pipelines. You don't need a pipeline to be able to preview the data. But to actually execute it and to actually try to write some of the data out to sync, you need to run it from within a pipeline. Now I'm in the pipeline editor and there's something I want you to be aware of, which is that the save option up here will only appear when you are connected to a, um, a code repository. And so you see I'm using GitHub for mine. And if you pull this down, you can see the other option, the other working mode we have is directly up against the live service, which we call the data factory working mode. Now I actually have another screen that I'm in that mode and I'll show you that one over here. So if I go to the, to the author here, you'll notice that I do not have save, I only have save as template. And I have to essentially publish every time I make a change. So if I were to, um, here I have a very simple uh, pipeline that's running two data flows. Let's say I wanted to add a, um, oh, I don't know, let's go ahead and look at an iteration type. Let's say I wanted to add a uh, for each in here. I don't have a save, I have a publish all. So publish all will actually publish all of this factory, these changes, the entire factory. Uh, with these pipeline changes, everything will get published to data factory directly. When I'm back on the mode where I'm working with GitHub, 
I can make changes so I can start to build my pipeline. I can create a uh, data flow in here and I'll just use an existing data flow for now just to demonstrate this. And now I can save. All right, without writing, without publishing directly to the service. What happens is this is writing out, this is saving um, everything within Data Factory as a JSON file. And so it's saving this configuration to my repo in GitHub. So I'm using GitHub, and you see the branch that I'm using is new branch. You can create new branches here, and you can also create pull requests from here. So essentially, then you'd merge your changes into another branch, and then you would publish from that branch, is the working model that you would use with uh, Git within Data Factory. Now all of these then get written to GitHub, so I'll show you my GitHub. And I have it, just give me one second, as soon as I can find it. Here it is, so this is the repo that I'm using. <clears throat> and each entity type has a folder. There's data flows, data sets, integration runtime, so on and so forth. And all those different branches that you saw, like new branch, are right here. So it's a, it's a code repository. It's great for uh, being able to uh, make it a of changes and to be able to deploy those. This is definitely the mode that I recommend. I will sometimes, uh, to give you the honest truth, I will sometimes work from the live service. And that's usually if I just want to make some quick change or just test something uh, using a trigger. Because what you should know too is that when you are working in a data factory and you've made a pipeline that has a data flow on it, you can test it and you can debug it all here from the, um, uh, from the Git mode. However, you have to publish this to the service before you can create a trigger and schedule it. So a trigger now or a scheduled run has to run from a published version of this factory. And that's because when you are uh, working from the Git mode without it being published, we can take those JSON files and we can run those in a sandbox in a data preview mode without it being published. All right. So I think we've established that. Now let me go ahead and, and start from a brand new uh, pipeline again. Again, remember, I like to start from pipelines because you need the pipeline anyway. And uh, if you like to explore your data and those sort of data exploration modes, that's when you can start with a data flow. Now, I do not have my data flow debug turned on. I'm going to turn that on right now. This will take about five to six minutes to turn on. Now, when you turn it on, you can use different integration runtimes. These define the type of backend Spark cluster that will spin up based on the request that you've made. So I have a couple of different ones. I have a small, a large, and a couple others. I'm just gonna use the auto resolve integration. This is the one that this runtime will be your default when you build a new factory. And this will work just fine. Now this spins up the cluster environment in the back end because everything within Dataflow when you transform data runs on Databricks cluster. So you need that Spark environment to really do anything. You can build and design, but you can't debug. You can't look at the data. You can look at the data live and interact with it in real time if you have the debug session turned on. Also debugging here from a pipeline won't work until of the data flow until you have your data flow debug session turned on. So first thing I always do is do that. This will stay alive for 60 minutes past the last thing that you do within your data flow. So if you preview some data, the timer starts and after 60 minutes, it times out, it goes away. Now let's start building a data flow. So here's my pipeline. I'm going to add a data flow onto my design surface. I'm gonna create a new one for uh, this tutorial. So we're gonna do a mapping data flow. Mapping data flow is building with your logic, your design, your graph first. If you want to explore your data and prep it, with simple transformations, you will want to start with your wrangling data flow. You can do most of this all within mapping. Mapping is sort of the supersets of all the data flow capabilities. So I'm going to start with mapping data flow. And what this is going to do is take us right into the design surface for the mapping data flow. Back on the pipeline, all it did was is it uh, created the uh, activity with the name based on the uh, data flow that it has created, which is data flow one. I'm gonna give this a more meaningful name, we'll call, uh, we'll call this. So let me step back for a second. What we wanna do in this demo is create a very simple data flow that is going to be based on aggregating some data. So essentially analytics. I'm not gonna go into the complexities of a different uh, star schema, data warehouse, or fuzzy matching lookup scenarios. Let's keep this very simple. So we're just gonna call this, and I'm going to do this on some um, uh, statistics from a, a, subs a subscription for radio service. So probably you know, like a satellite radio service. I'm going to call this radio data flow. Radio data flow. And for the data flow itself, we'll go back and to edit that and we'll call this radio. And we'll call it a little, little bit different. We'll call this my data flow uh, radio. There we go. 
All right, so there's our activity and it's pointing to our data flow. Now, I'm just going to put a couple of quick uh, nodes on this graph just to show you how to use data flow. And then in the next video, I'm going to pick up how to build the logic for this. So to start building your data flow, you always click on the source. You can add as many sources as you like. And I'm only going to need one, so I'm going to actually go back in and delete these now. <laughs> I showed you that. So we're just going to have one for this demo. And the source, I will give a name. Actually, no, I'm going to leave the source one. That's just fine. Now, I need a data set for my radio data. So you will click New. And I have my radio data is, is JSON, so it's going to be within uh, Blob Store. So you pick Blob Store is where it's located. The type then is what you select next, which is JSON. And we'll call this JSON Radio. I already have that, so I'll call it JSON Radio 2. And I already have a link service, but you'll need to create a link service, which will, uh, I'll actually walk you through that real quick. So link service is how you connect into the different storage locations that you have in Azure. Um, and so this is all fine and I'm going to use for my subscription. I'm going to just pause right here. So I went through creating a link service rather than showing that to you because I don't want to have to hide all of my credentials and authentication information. I'll just say just fill out the rest of that and then connect into your blob store or your ADL. I get the idea. We're going to use blob store. Now we can point to the file. So you have to have your file uploaded somewhere within blob or ADLS. In my case, I have it here on blob. I have it under sample data and I have it under JSON. It is called Small Radio JSON. And there's only a few rows in there. It's not a very big file. But here you'll see you have options to be able to import the schema. If you don't have, if you actually have the schema uh, somewhere in a separate file, you can always say, uh, here's my data, but uh, map those to the schema that I have defined in a sample file. So you can create a, a sample file in text editor and upload from here as well. That's all we really need to do. I think we're good right here. So we can click OK. Notice my debug session now is ready, so that's ready. So now we can look at the data in real time. And why don't we just go ahead and do that? So we can go ahead and click on Data Preview, click Refresh, and we'll see what the data looks like. The first time you run uh, a Data Preview, we will have to go and um, connect into your uh, interactive cluster. And this was spun up, and we'll have to go and pull the uh, configuration from it and also execute this flow for the first time. And there is the data, so we can look at this real quick. You see that we have a timestamp, user ID, session ID, uh, page. Okay, so this is actually probably from a web page then. So I think what we'll do is we'll probably aggregate. We have location, we have uh, gender, song length. So we'll probably aggregate on, let's do maybe some aggregation on, okay, we have free or paid service and we have location. So we'll use those as well as maybe the gender. I'm going to walk you through that logic in the next video. I'm going to finish this video by just by showing you one more thing. The data flow debug that we spun up, we spun up using, in my case, the auto resolve integration runtime, which is what you get by default. You can create larger or smaller clusters by going into connections. Connections is where you manage your integration runtimes. To create a separate cluster environment that you can use, you click on New Integration Runtimes. You will click Azure, and you'll give it a name. You could call this, you know, my um, small or large or medium cluster. And then under here, under Data Flow Runtime, is where you will set the type of compute you want: general compute uh, optimized or memory optimized. Uh, the pricing is compute optimized is the uh, le less costly, memory optimized is the most the number of cores that you want to run, and then a TTL. A time to live will allow us to maintain a pool of resources for that amount of time to make the spin up time less. Dataflow is predicated on the ability for you to spin up the backend Spark database cluster environment only when you run your job. So it's very, very cost effective. All right, I think we're good for the initial setup of Dataflows. Uh, we'll pick this up in the next video. Thanks.